Um, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Julian Burnside. Uh, Julian is not someone who was known uh, to Renata, amazingly, um, <laughs> but, uh, but <laughs> was, was very quick to take up the offer to, to become the, uh, the seventh uh, deliverer of the Renata Kamina oration. Uh, Julian did uh, law and economics at Monash University, uh, completed degrees in both of those in the early 70s. And Julian, when I read a you know, very high work <coughs> being Wikipedia, it claims that you had um, aspirations at the time of doing your law degree to be a management consultant. Um, I don't know if that's true, but you know, life could have been very different. And, um, I actually enrolled in law myself, so we could have swapped places maybe. Um, Julian was admitted as a barrister to the Supreme Court in, in 1976 and appointed a Queen's, a Queen's Council in 1989. Until the late 1990s, uh, Julian largely worked for what might be called the big end of town, uh, working for some well-known um, uh, corporate uh, success stories, as Alan Bond, amongst others. Uh, but in, in 1998, uh, he surprised many by uh, acting for the Maritime Union in his battle against Patrick Corporation in what was became known as the Australian Waterfront Dispute. Um, and that's you know, just when I think Julian became more widely known and, and that's that dispute and Julian's character himself has been turned into a TV documentary that uh, many might have seen. Um, from then on, that led to Julian doing increased pro bono work, uh, particularly working on behalf of asylum seekers and Indigenous Australians. He and his wife, wife Kate Durham, who's here with us, set up spare rooms for refugees and spare lawyers for refugees. Um, and, and it was setting up that organisation that resulted in one of the many awards that uh, Julian received uh, from the Human Rights Law Award from the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission. Uh, Julian was also awarded um, as Officer of the Order of Australia in 2009. Julian, we we'll look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be here, and especially in the presence of Glenn Davis, who gave this oration in 2011, I think. 13. Um, I wanted to start by saying what a fine thing it is to uh, remember a loved one with an annual speech, to remember your mother each year by a public act of remembering is a really wonderful thing. And it reminded me of, or made me think of, um, something Prospero said at the end of The Tempest. He said, we are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Um, if Shakespeare was right, then um, this oration, this annual oration, means that the street, street of sleep will not be dreamless. <laughs> but I hope that the topic I've chosen won't make it a nightmare this year. <laughs> um, in fact, listening to Todd, I was thinking maybe I should have chosen to talk about wave particle duality in quantum physics. It might have been less contentious. <laughs> the rabbi who celebrated uh, Renata's life at the crematorium um, on the third, Friday the 13th of March, what a day, said of her, we're gathered to show our great love, admiration and appreciation of a remarkable and special woman, Renata Kamala, adored daughter, loving wife and life partner, wonderful mother, supportive sister-in-law, welcoming mother-in-law, I, th I think the cascade of adjectives is interesting, generous and giving colleague and trusted and valued friend. Incidentally, as I learned, the rabbi turned up an hour late um, because he got the time wrong and Renata had been known to all her friends as being chronically late and uh, it prompted one member of the family to say that even in death she keeps us waiting. <laughs> um, in his um, Renata Kamala oration in 2011, Gareth Evans said this and Gareth and Renata knew each other. Renata Kamala was a remarkable woman I feel honoured and privileged to have been invited by her family to give this second oration in her memory. I was first introduced to Renata and Bob more decades ago than any of us would now care to remember by my then Melbourne University Law School colleague and their fellow refugee from the South African apartheid region, regime, Julian Phillips. And it was in that context that I first became aware of the risks that they had taken in opposing that regime 
and their passionate commitment against racism in any form and for human dignity and decency in every form. And Gareth spoke movingly of Renato Kavanagh's intense commitment to Israeli-Palestinian reconciliation and of what he referred to as a life of great and recognised service to humanity. Now, Renata Kaminer was born on the 8th of June 1933 in Breslau in Germany, and as the rabbi pointed out, uh, mention of Germany in 1933 will immediately ring alarm bells for many of you as the year that Hitler became Chancellor and began to put into practice his anti-Jewish rhetoric. Now, as many people in this room will be aware, anti-Semitism has a long and dismal history, uh, but notoriously reached its appalling uh, peak in Germany between 1933 and 1945. Gareth touched on this in his oration in 2011, when he said, as no one here this evening needs reminding, least of all the Kamina family, who like so many others of you have contributed so much to the Australian community, since you or your forebears fled the horrors of Europe of the 1930s and 40s. No crime in history has been more grotesque than the Nazi Holocaust with its comprehensively and meticulously organised extermination of six million Jews. Even if some other mass atrocity crimes, those of Stalin and Mao for a start, have involved even more unbelievably large numbers, none has more fundamentally demeaned our sense of common humanity. Now, I don't intend to rehearse the miserable history of anti-Semitism. It, it traces its sources a very long way back. It's often overlooked that the document which was signed at Runnymede on the 12th of June, 1215, and later called Magna Carta, contained several provisions which disappeared in the 1225 edition. It contained several provisions which were explicitly anti-Semitic. Um, Shakespeare's plays, <coughs> four centuries later, reflect the enduring anti-Semitism in Britain. Uh, and the trial of Alfred Dreyfus in 1894 uh, was an expression of deep-seated anti-Semitism in France in those years. And it's not often remembered that the Vichy regime, during the Second World War, deported Madeleine Dreyfus, uh, Alfred Dreyfus's granddaughter, deported her and she died in a concentration camp in Auschwitz, uh, where she was gassed. Um, now, as most of you are aware, I, I mention those things because I do not wish to suggest that uh, anti-Semitism, as it is now uh, most notoriously remembered, is equivalent to Islamophobia in scale. It is clearly not. Islamophobia has not yet led to the sort of horrors uh, that Gareth mentioned, the sort of horrors that we all have read about from the 1930s and 40s. But um, I, I did think it useful to see the connection with uh, Islamophobia, or the connection between Islamophobia and anti-Semitism because of the things which it lets people do. Now, as many of you will be aware, I've been concerned about our treatment of boat people over the last a uh, few years, and the origins of the conspicuous mistreatment of boat people can be traced back to the Tampa episode, which a number of you will remember. The Tampa, of course, had rescued, on the 26th of August 2001, it rescued 434 Afghan Hazaras who fled the Taliban. Their boat was falling apart in the Indian Ocean. The Australian government was aware of it and radioed the Tampa, a Norwegian cargo ship, which was known to be in the area. They asked the captain of the Tampa to rescue the people whose boat was falling apart. The uh, uh, captain of the Tampa, who thought initially there might have been 50 people in the boat, was astounded when 434 of them climbed up the rope ladder onto the steel decks of the Tampa. Um, he uh, presumably was aware that these people were escaping the Taliban, a regime uh, which was so harsh that just a couple of months later we joined the Americans in trying to blast it back to the Stone Age. But uh, the, um, the response to the Tampa episode um, led to a policy designed to make people think that persecution at home is better than seeking safety and protection in Australia. 
And when the Tampa um, entered Australian territorial waters off Christmas Island, Christmas Island is that little speck of Australian sovereignty in the Indian Ocean, and the captain of the Tampa decided to try and put these people ashore at Christmas Island because it was the next available place on his voyage, and second, because a number of the people he rescued were unconscious, there were pregnant women, people were in pretty bad state of health. Um, and in addition, there was the tiny practical reality that the Tampa was licensed to carry 50 people. He had 47 crew, and all of a sudden, 434 unexpected passengers. So he defied the Australian government and entered Australian territorial waters off Christmas Island. The response of John Howard was to send out the SAS, who took command of the bridge at gunpoint. And then there was a standoff. The, um, the, the Tampa just stayed where it was, some miles offshore from Christmas Island, uh, the bridge controlled by the SAS. Now, because of that standoff, uh, the matter went to the federal court in Melbourne, and uh, the case ran for, I think, five days. The judge reserved his decision and handed down his judgment at 2.15 in the afternoon, Melbourne time, on the 11th of September, 2001, exactly 15 years ago today. Ten hours later, the attack on America happened, and all of a sudden, the whole world seemed to change. All of a sudden, you no longer had terrorists, you only had Muslim terrorists. All of a sudden, you no longer had boat people, you only had Muslim boat people. All of a sudden, John Howard started calling boat people illegal, even though they commit no offence by coming uninvited and asking for protection from persecution. The, the idea that, uh, of course, more recently it morphed into border protection, the, the thought, thought that we need to be protected from frightened Hazaras fleeing the Taliban is so ludicrous that it doesn't even deserve discussion. Um, the, the coalition have since persisted in referring to both people as illegal, notwithstanding that it is completely false. Um, when Tony Abbott won the election in 2013 and Scott Morrison became his immigration minister, Morrison um, renamed the Department of Immigration and Citizenship the Department of Immigration and Border Protection, conveying the impression to the public at large that the whole wicked enterprise is protecting us from criminals. Now, if it were true, it might make sense, but it's false. It wasn't easy to watch an interview with Scott Morrison without hearing him referring to illegals. Actually, it wasn't easy to watch an interview with Scott Morrison at all. <laughs> but uh, perhaps the way he disfigured his interviews by dishonest references to illegals and border protection was a nice metaphor for the way his brand of politics and religious hypocrisy disfigured his time as minister. Um, now, it's a, it's a matter of history that the Abbott government and subsequently, I guess, the Turnbull government uh, has been uh, populated largely by the leading characters in both governments have been people conspicuously Christian but dedicated to the idea of vilifying refugees to have the temerity to escape from places like Aleppo or places like Kabul or places like Quetta in Pakistan people seeking safety from persecution uh, and they are dedicated to vilifying those people so that we will think it's all right to mistreat them. Um, but the fact is, as many of you here I'm sure recognise, boat people don't threaten our borders in any relevant sense and we don't need to be protected from them. Uh, but government prop propaganda, which has never been contradicted by the Labour Party, don't mistake me for adopting a party political position on this, uh, the Labour Party have never taken the stand of saying, look, they're not illegal, don't listen to what the government says. Uh, the continued rhetoric over the last 15 years uh, has persuaded a significant percentage of the Australian public that it is, it's okay to uh, attack, mistreat these people. Now, if in fact we were being protected from criminals, then a lot of what's going on might make sense. Uh, if it goes a bit too far, well then I guess the answer is you can't make omelettes without breaking eggs. But it's false. 
and here's the way of testing it. When you see footage of a child behind the wire in Nauru, ask yourself whether she looks like a criminal. Ask yourself whether you think you need to be protected from her. Um, the, the whole illegals and border protection thing looks dramatically different when you see that both people are held in detention for an indefinite time <coughs> and that it crushes their spirit. Now, what we do to them is little short of astonishing. And in fact, if, if someone dropped in on Australian society and noticed what we do and asked why we put up with it, I suspect that there would be no good answer. Um, I was interested when Todd said that if you tell someone over and over what they are, that's what they will believe. Well, I think you can broaden that. We have been told over and over that both people are illegal and that's what a lot of the community believe and all the rest of it seems to follow. And what we do to them um, is astonishing. Um, when boats were able to arrive, and when the turn back the boats thing, you know, don't forget, they, they continue to set out. They just don't get here because we turn them away. Um, but when they used to be able to arrive at Christmas Island, uh, the way they were treated was perhaps a forewarning of what lay ahead of them. They would uh, typically have been on the ocean for seven or eight days. They've typically come from countries that are landlocked and so they've never even seen the ocean, let alone been on it. They've typically had not enough to eat. They've typically had no opportunity to change their clothes or wash themselves. They typically arrive in clothing caked with their own excrement and before they are allowed the simple dignity of washing themselves and changing their clothes, they are interviewed by an officer of the Immigration Department. The purpose of the interview is to see whether they are asking for protection. Um, they are then assessed by medical staff employed by IHMS to see whether there is any reason why they can't be removed forcibly against their will and taken to another country, specifically Manus Island, part of PNG, or Nauru, a <coughs> sovereign republic in the Central Pacific. When they are taken there, they are given the assurance that they will never be allowed to resettle in Australia. So when the doctors uh, examine them, they are typically not given enough time to examine them properly. But if anyone is found to be um, unable to be moved, well then they remain in detention on Christmas Island. The, the treatment they get on Christmas Island is very strange. Once they've arrived, if they've got any medical devices, spectacles, false teeth, prosthetic limbs, those are confiscated and not returned. If they have any medication on them, it is taken and disposed of. If they have any medical documentation, it is taken and disposed of. So that people with chronic conditions find themselves quickly unmedicated and undiagnosed. A doctor who worked on Christmas Island told me of a, an occasion she remembered very sharply. There was a woman held on Christmas Island who had been there for a few weeks. She had been held there rather than being removed to Nauru because it was thought that she was insane. But no one quite knew the nature of her insanity or what sort of treatment it needed. Uh, not surprising given that if she had any medication or medical documents they had been taken and disposed of. Anyway, the doctor decided to hold an interview with this woman, a, con a consultation with this woman. It was a difficult consultation because although they were on opposite sides of the same table, they didn't have a language in common. And the interpreter was connected to them by telephone from Sydney, 5,300 kilometres away. It took the doctor quite a long time to work out the problem. The problem, as it turns out, was that the woman was incontinent of urine and she couldn't leave her cabin without having urine running down her leg and it was driving her mad. So the doctor said to immigration, we need incontinence pads for this lady. Their first response was, we don't do those. She insisted. So immigration agreed to provide incontinence pads, but only four per day. More than that, they said, would be a fire hazard. <laughs> uh, is the sort of thing you're dealing with. Um, 
Uh, as soon as she got incontinence pads, the woman's demeanour changed fundamentally. And all of a sudden, she was a normal person again. Perhaps not surprising. Um, the, uh, once they are removed from Australia and sent to another country, uh, Manus Island, which is north of Port Moresby, it's on the equator, um, at the moment, um, unaccompanied men get sent to Manus Island. If they are women, unaccompanied children or family groups, they get sent to Nauru. Nauru, just so you remember it, Nauru, uh, an independent republic, Nauru is smaller than Tullamarine Airport. And yet we think it's an appropriate place for warehousing refugees for them. Uh, Manus Island uh, is a place which has generated great problems. Some of you will recall that in <coughs> February 2014, Reza Barati was killed on Manus Island during a disturbance there. Um, Scott Morrison, true to form, went on air and assured the public that Reza Barati had escaped from the detention centre and had been killed by locals. It turned out that was untrue. It turned out, because we received signed eyewitness statements a couple of weeks later, that Reza Barati had been killed inside the detention centre by some of the people paid by Australia to look after the detainees. Um, one of the eyewitness statements was made by a man called Benham Sattar. Benham Sattar wrote that um, he'd seen Reza Barati running back towards the cabin that he had his bed in. He was approached by a man who's named. This man worked for the Salvation Army as a subcontractor to the Department of Immigration. He had a long piece of timber in his hand with two long nails driven through the far end. He swung it wildly at Reza Barati and hit him on the head twice with it. Reza Barati fell to the ground, streaming blood from his scalp. He was then surrounded by 12 guards, guards on the Australian payroll, who took it in turns to kick him in the head and in the torso, and eventually a Salvation Army worker picked up a large rock and brought it crashing down on Reza Barati's head and as Benham Sattar said, that killed him, and I know it killed him because the next time one of the guards kicked him, he didn't flinch. Now, that's the way, that's the way Reza Barati was killed, but the story didn't stop there. Benham Sattar and the other eyewitness were taken into the Wilson security cabin in the, de in the detention centre. Wilson security are a subcontractor of the Department of Immigration, they provide the guard services, um, and if ever you see the Wilson security signs on the local parks, um, it's probably worth remembering and visually superimposing on it a sign which says Wilson security, Nauru, Manus, Panama, because it is apparently incorporated in Panama to avoid the inconvenience of paying Australian tax. The um, Benham Sattar and his colleague, the other eyewitness, were taken into the Wilson security hut and there they were tied to chairs and beaten up by the Wilson security guards. They were told that if they didn't withdraw their eyewitness statements, they'd be taken outside the detention centre and would be publicly raped by PNG locals. Um, to his credit, Benham Sattar did not withdraw his statement and although it took two years, the man who killed Reza Barati was eventually brought to trial, although he was subsequently allowed to escape. Um, in early 2015, I got an email from a health worker on Manus who said, the situation, as you can imagine, is very grim. Around 80% of transferees are suffering serious mental health issues. PNG staff are slowly being trained, in inverted commas, to take over various roles with mostly undesirable results. East Lorengau is not working. East Lorengau is the place outside the detention centre where people assessed as refugees are urged to live. Um, one refugee is lingering in hospital for over two weeks with undiagnosed stomach problems. One refugee doctor is suffering severe mental health issues. And then, here's an interesting story. The, um, <clears throat> early last year I had a meeting in my chambers with a few former health workers from Manus and a senior Labor parliamentarian. The, uh, one of the doctors captivated everyone's attention because, unlike me, he's not a bleeding heart. Uh, he has 
spent his entire professional career working in the prison system in Australia, and he decided to do a tour of duty on Manus because the pay was good. He said that when he first arrived at the compound at Manus, his immediate inner response was, this is what the concentration camps must have been like. After he'd worked inside for a week, he formed the view that the conditions they're held in and the way they're treated was a hundred times worse than he's seen in any Australian prison, including maximum security prisons. So we treat people in maximum security prisons better than we treat innocent human beings who've simply asked for a bit of protection. Um, he, he also said that by the end of his tour of duty, he formed the view that the barely concealed purpose of the whole exercise was to break the spirit of the detainees so they'd abandon their claims for protection and go back to the country that was persecuting them. Um, the, the meeting broke up and the health people left, the Labor parliamentarian stayed on and said, and I believe him, that he was shocked to hear these things because he just simply did not know it was as bad as that. And he, he said how appalling it was. And without missing a beat, he said, of course, it would be political suicide for Labor to take a soft line on boats. And that sentence alone tells you almost everything that is wrong with Australian politics these days, um, when it is politically desirable to allow innocent human beings to be mistreated because the political alternative is undesirable. Now, so that's Manus. Um, and many of you will have seen the Four Corners episode of a month or so ago about Hamid Kazai, who cut his foot in the Manus Detention Centre and it became infected. And the doctors very quickly became concerned because the conditions there are so uh, unclean. He, uh, the doctors urged that he should be medically evacuated to Brisbane because he needed really urgent treatment. The department thought it might be better and cheaper to airlift him to Port Moresby. They wheeled him on a trolley onto the airstrip uh, so he could be flown <coughs> to Port Moresby, but they missed the plane. And they left him on the trolley, in the sun, on the airstrip, for another plane to arrive. Eventually, he was in fact flown, after a delay of about 36 hours, he was flown to Brisbane. Scott Morrison distinguished himself yet again by his economy with the truth by saying publicly that now Hamid Kazai was in Brisbane receiving the best possible medical attention. He forgot to add that Hamid Kazai was already brain dead because of the septicemia which had set in. <coughs> now on Nauru, of course, things are notoriously bad and uh, we've had reports from Sarah Hanson Young who visited there when she was the Green spokesman for uh, immigration. Recently, about four weeks ago, I think, several thousand files were leaked, the Nauru files were leaked. These are reports mostly prepared by the uh, Russian security people, um, and yet the mainstream press thought they could downplay the significance of the whole thing. Um, and those files gave an interesting insight into what is going on. It included hundreds of reports of sexual assault on detainees, mostly by guards and some by locals who aren't guards. Uh, it included dozens of accounts of sexual assaults on children in detention, mostly by guards. And no one has yet been prosecuted in Nauru for any of the assaults on any of the detainees. It's as if they're just fair game and it was very interesting. The public in Australia, you will remember the uproar when the Don Dale um, events in Darwin were disclosed, where dreadful mistreatment of a dozen uh, juvenile defender, uh, offenders was revealed. But when hundreds, thousands of cases of mistreatment of asylum seekers on the route was revealed, just a week or two later, there was almost no public response and certainly no Royal Commission. Um, the uh, one document that I've seen which I thought was quite striking uh, was a Save the Children document. It was a document in which Save the Children, who until they were kicked out uh, of Nauru, 
they were there in order to try and help protect the children who were there in detention. Save the Children uh, report showed that they had insisted to their staff that Save the Children staff should not spend longer than five weeks on Nauru at a time because longer than that would be bad for their mental health. And we've had children on Nauru for more than three years in the same conditions. Um, so then you have to ask yourself, well, why? Why are we behaving like this? Why are we so shockingly mistreating thousands of people who've done nothing worse than ask us for protection from persecution? Why is it that we mistreat innocent people so that they, uh, even children in detention, try to kill themselves? And I think the real answer is Islamophobia. Since September 11, since just 15 years ago, the Western world has been induced to think that all boat people are Muslims and all Muslims are terrorists and therefore they're all threatened by our way of life and our very existence. The idea that uh, people who come to Australia without papers, without an invitation, causes so much anxiety is almost beyond explanation. Um, it's often overlooked that they are just coming here to be safe uh, and perhaps, perhaps our response to them is a dim echo of 1788. Uh, in a, a very entertaining book called Gert by David Hunt recently, there's a, it's a, it's a book about the first three decades of white settlement in Australia. And there's a cartoon in it in which a black fella is standing looking down at the tall ships in Sydney Cove. He's got a can of British paint in one hand and he scrawled on an adjacent wall, turn back the boats. <laughs> um, the, the response to Tampa and the subsequent response to boat people generally has gone through three distinct phases. Um, the first reaction, and the one that has endured, is calling them illegals. Um, and queue jumpers, as if there is some queue somewhere, no one's ever identified quite where it is. Um, the, uh, the, the calling them illegals is dishonest um, uh, and, and then the renaming of the Department of Immigration and Border Protection is ludicrous. But we think it necessary to be able to disparage them because otherwise how can we justify mistreating them? And it's an irony that while we fear boat people as possible extremists, possible terrorists, we overlook the fact that on the figures in the last 15 or 20 years, boat people are underrepresented in crime figures in Australia. So far as I'm aware, no boat person has ever been found to be involved in any terrorist act uh, in Australia. And uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the fact is that the key dog whistle message is we have to be afraid of these people. And fear is a very powerful political weapon. Um, it's worth remembering um, how far down the slide this took us. You'll remember the 2013 federal election. In 2013, both major political parties tried to outbid each other with the promises of cruelty with which they would treat a particular group of human beings. I don't think we've ever seen the equal of that in Australia before, uh, but it's a, a very disturbing idea that you could court political popularity by promising cruelty to a group of people. If they promised cruelty to animals, I suspect it would not have worked. But cruelty to people who are ostensibly Muslim, uh, that seemed to be such a good idea. Um, it's, it's also rather curious that we have not worked out that if people are fleeing extremism, they probably aren't extremists themselves. We haven't worked out that if people are fleeing terrorism, they're probably not terrorists. Um, they're just frightened people. The next phase of the, of the campaign, which was ostensibly supported the mistreatment of boat people, was um, an attack on people smugglers. You may recall that in about 2007 or 8, the whole episode, the whole thing went off the boil. And then in 2009, um, 
Tony Abbott became leader of the opposition. Uh, he started attacking the Rudd government for the fact that boats were arriving carrying asylum seekers. And all of a sudden, Kevin Rudd counterattacked by a ferocious attack, not on the boat people, but on the people smugglers, the people who help people, other people seek protection from persecution. Um, he, in April 2009, Rudd said that people smugglers were the absolute scum of the earth and should rot in hell. Um, he said, people smugglers are engaged in the world's most evil trade and they should all rot in jail. Now, his venom, I think, was a response to the visible deaths of people on an asylum seeker boat which had exploded off the northwest coast. And it may be that he thought that attacking the uh, asylum seekers themselves were no longer a good look, so instead attacked the people smugglers. Uh, oddly, he seems to have forgotten that his great moral hero, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, was also a people smuggler. He seems to have overlooked that Oscar Schindler, who we read about and saw on the film, seemed like a good guy, he was also a people smuggler. He seems to have forgotten that Gustav Schroeder was a people smuggler. Gustav Schroeder, you will recall, was the captain of the St. Louis that embarked from Hamburg in May of 1939 with 900 Jews on board. They went from right across the world until they got to Cuba. He did everything he could to get them a place to be put ashore. Uh, he was a people smuggler by any, by any test. Uh, he was not able to put them ashore. He was fended off the coast of Florida at gunpoint and ended up taking them back to Europe where he put them ashore in Antwerp. And shortly afterwards, when the Low Countries were invaded, uh, more than half of those people were taken to concentration camps where they died. Um, the, the fact is that Gustav Schroeder acted heroically, uh, even though he was a people smuggler. We tend to overlook the fact that people smugglers, maybe even the really unscrupulous ones, they provide a need, they help people escape things that are even worse than the treatment that they might get at the hands of the people smugglers. It's also, it also struck me as an interesting irony, given John, John Howard's um, social positioning, um, he probably grew up watching The Sound of Music. And in The Sound of Music, the Von Trapp family are refugees and the nuns were people smugglers. <laughs> <laughs> the um, ferocity of the attack on uh, people smugglers uh, became a lot worse and a lot more intense when a boat uh, crashed on the shores of Christmas Island in December 2010. Uh, it was a shocking sight. It was televised and uh, significantly increased the political impact of attacking people smugglers. And of course, it is tragic when people die trying to escape. But here's the thing, and I'm sure there's no one in this room who has not thought about this at some point. Imagine yourself, just for a moment, imagine that you are, say, um, a Hazara from Afghanistan. You've seen your friends picked off in the streets by sniper, Taliban snipers. You've seen your friends who've been dragged off the bus and picked out from the other passengers and executed and left by the roadside. You've seen the children who've lost their legs because they were used by the Taliban as human minesweepers at the end of the uh, American attack on Afghanistan. You've lost relatives and you eventually think, it's all too much, I'm out of here. And so you escape. And you manage to find your way down to the southeast, passing entirely through countries that have not signed the Refugees Convention, and eventually you get to Indonesia, which has also not signed the Refugees Convention. You can get a visa on arrival that lasts one month. And if you can go to the UNHCR office in Jakarta and get a certificate which says you're a refugee, because if you're a Hazar from Afghanistan, then it's overwhelmingly likely that you are a refugee. But after one month, when your visa runs out, you have to hide, because if the authorities find you, they will jail you. And if you've got children with you, you can't send them to school because you'll be found and you'll be thrown in jail. 
You can't get a job because you'll be found and you'll be thrown in jail. You can wait until some country offers to resettle you. That will take, on current indications, 20 or 30 years. Or you can take your courage in both hands and put your fate in the hands of these vile people smugglers. That will get you across to Australia where, um, if everything goes well, you'll be recognised as a refugee and you'll be protected. I wonder if there's anyone in this room who would not use a people smuggler in those circumstances. By what right do we criticise and mistreat people who do exactly what we would do if we had the misfortune to be in their position? But that is precisely what Australia is doing. Um, I suspect that if uh, you or I or any of us had been a Jew in Germany in 1939, if we'd had a chance to use a people smuggler, we would have done exactly that, uh, because the alternative is ludicrous. The, the, next interesting, the next interesting development in the excuse for mistreating boat people was what I like to call the drownings excuse. Um, after, the, after the very conspicuous drownings off Christmas Island in December 2010, when incidentally 50 or 52 people drowned, not 1,200, um, after those drownings, which captured everyone's attention, the government and the, and the Labour Party insisted that it was essential to stop the boats in order to protect people from the risks of drowning. Now, right <coughs> on its face might be a noble thing. The fact is, what are the alternatives? Let's suppose a person doesn't set out and doesn't face the risk of drowning. Would they rather rot in the shadows in Indonesia for 20 years? I'm not sure that's preferable. Would they prefer to go back and face the Taliban? and risk being killed there. Of course, if you're killed by the Taliban, you're just as dead as if you drowned. Some of you may remember that uh, an asylum seeker called Omid Masumali, who had been assessed on Nauru, uh, he and his family had been assessed on Nauru as refugees and entitled to protection, but it was uncertain where they could be sent, if anywhere. <coughs> he was so desperate of the idea that they might have to spend the rest of their days on Nauru that he publicly doused himself in petrol and set himself on fire. It was a horrible scene. But Kathy Wilcox captured things perfectly in a cartoon a couple of days later. It's a simple cartoon of a man engulfed in flames and the caption read simply, not drowning. Um, the, the, the drowning's excuse is just a, a dishonest way of salving our conscience, thinking we're doing something good as a cover for doing things that are wicked. So, we have these three false explanations for doing what we're doing. Um, uh, engaging in conduct which I hope does not reflect the real spirit of this country. So, what's the true explanation? Uh, a leading politician once said this, it is the leaders of the country who determine the policy, and it's always a simple matter to drag the people along, whether it's a democracy or a fascist dictatorship or a parliament or a communist dictatorship. Voice or no voice, the people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. That is easy. All you have to do is tell them they're being attacked and denounce the peacemakers for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same in any country at any time. I wonder how many people recognise the part of the politician who said that. It was Hermann Goering at the Nuremberg Trials in 1946. Um, it's hard to contradict the statement, and it's hard not to notice the parallels between that comment and what we are doing in Australia now. Um, it's a matter of real concern that anti-Islamic views in Australia now seem to be led by our political masters. A survey in Australia in 2015 suggests that real Islamophobia um, in the community at large is relatively mild. Um, there's maybe 20% who are, um, or sorry, 10% who are highly Islamophobic, 20% uncertain, 70% low level of Islamophobia. Um, the, um, it seems, though, that Islamophobia in this country is driven from the top in order to provide a, a, a cover for doing something that had proved to be popular in the electorate. Now, 
I don't want to be misunderstood in this. I deplore Muslim terrorism and extremism. But equally, I deplore Christian terrorism and extremism, or Jewish terrorism and extremism, or Hindu terrorism and extremism. I, I, even terrorism and extremism with no ideological foundation, I deplore. But uh, it isn't uh, an accident that in this country nowadays, uh, we are repelling people who are just see seeking a safe place to live. We're repelling them uh, as an element of national security. It is, the, it is the thing which is being done to make us feel as though we're being protected from a fear which they induced in us. It's no accident that since uh, September 11, 15 years ago, women who wear a headscarf in public feel unsafe. I had a friend, a woman in her mid-50s, Indian, who wore a headscarf. She's been, I think, a citizen for 30-something years in Australia. And after September 11, 2001, for the first time, she found herself being spat on in public transport. Uh, it's no accident that the news emphasises Islamic terrorism in a way which we did not see during the 20th century, when for 60 or 70 years, Northern Ireland was riven by uh, sect, Christian sectarian uh, skirmishes and appalling acts of terrorism there and in England. I don't think it's any accident that in recent years a number of Australian Jews <coughs> have begun to express concern at the mistreatment of asylum seekers because they seem to recognise that Islamophobia is an excuse that looks worryingly like anti-Semitism. Every Jew knows where that can lead. Thank you. Well, that was exactly the question, actually. Oh, really? I was going to ask you, you face so much of this so frequently, how in heaven's name do you get out of bed in the morning? And what is it, what is it that gives you the sustenance to keep doing that? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you. I found it very difficult. I mean, when I, when I did the Tampa case and saw what was going on, and I didn't really know what we were doing to refugees, but I thought it's really bad. And I was... Even though I'm not interested in politics, I could see that it was um, really a, just a matter of politics. It was just the people being misled. So I thought, well, what I need to do is start speaking out. Because if 50% plus one of the public change their view, then the politics would change. Um, I miscalculated how long that might take. <laughs> I, I felt uncomfortable doing it because there is a thing at the bar that you don't speak out. And I felt very uncomfortable doing it. And I was criticised by a lot of people for doing it apart from the usual sort of attacks and hate mail and so on. But Kate and I were at a social function and the wife of a very distinguished colleague sidled up to me and said, oh, do you think it appropriate that a member of the bar should speak publicly about these matters? And without the benefit of preparation, I said, well, do you think it appropriate to know about these matters and stay silent? And that had two benefits. The first is it resolved in my own mind why speaking out was the thing to do. And second, she never spoke to me again. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, of course it gets tiring, but I'm just horrified. I would hate to think that I would see these things happening. And I mean, I get all sorts of information from all sorts of people about what's actually going on. I would hate to think that I could just go to my grave having ignored it. You can't. I think our society is better than that. And it needs to be saved from its politicians. Well, thank you so much for doing it. Yes. I'm a Muslim, and it kind of goes against the grain to say, 
Oh, thank you, first of all, for your lecture to please some last night, which was very strong and powerful, and your evidence of that, and for your advocacy in this area. Before I then say, I actually disagree with you. I don't think it's all about us, in the sense that I think maybe you're conflating cause and effect when you say that it's Islamophobia that enables us to see asylum seekers in that light. And the reason I think it's important to raise this is because I think it is possible. Of course, September 11 helped a lot in tagging mainly Muslim asylum seekers so they can be labeled in that way. But I think, there are, I think that actually it's the association of Muslims with asylum seekers, with these people who are infiltrating and invading and transgressing our borders you know, and breaking our laws that's actually <coughs> in part, not as much as terrorism, but in part contributing to the <coughs> islamophobia. We're not just terrorists, but we're both people with and welfare's family, and so on. And as I said, I think the reason it's important to raise this is because I think we shouldn't think that other groups, if they are similarly destitute, not like wealthy asylum seekers who can get business visas and pay for airfares and things, but if they were similarly destitute and similarly um, desperate and even make use of, of, of people smugglers to get here, would not be actually similarly labelled. <coughs> and would not contribute to similar levels of racialization of their identities too. Which you can see that a little bit happening with the Sri Lankan asylum seekers and, and, so, and not to such a level. <coughs> well, let, let me deal with one element and then ask you what do you think the explanation is um, that we tolerate grotesque mistreatment of innocent human beings. But the, the one thing to mention is you referred to uh, people who can come here with, um, did you say less wealthy, more wealthy? More wealthy. Who can come here? Well, I was thinking of uh, yeah. refugees. Can I say, refugees. If, if, you, if you are seeking to get to Australia to seek asylum, it is more expensive to use a people smoker than to come by aeroplane. But you can't go, get on an aeroplane to get into Australia unless you've got travel documents yeah, that's from why your own country visas. and a visa. That's why exactly. admission business visas and yeah. student visas. And, and, and quite a few refugees do come to Australia that way. They come in on a business visa, tourist visa, study visa, and once they've cleared passport control, they apply for asylum. And when their initial visa runs out, they're given a bridging visa, so they remain in the community and for, for as long as it takes. But only about 30 or 40% of them are ultimately assessed as genuine refugees. The rest are just giving it a go. Now, by contrast, amongst boat people who typically can't get a travel documents from their country of origin or can't get a visa to come to Australia, um, boat people who come here the only way they can and who pay more for it than an airfare, those people uh, in the last 15 years have been assessed by us as genuine refugees in more than 90% of cases. So the, the irony of this is that we're completely untroubled by the ones who are probably not refugees, uh, and we're terribly e exercised by the ones who are almost certainly refugees. That makes no sense. So what would be your explanation for the fact that we tolerate the mistreatment of innocent people? Um, broadly similar to your own, but I think you... Not, I, I write a lot about Islamophobia. I don't underestimate the magnitude of it. But one of the things, and actually one of the things that intrigues me about the parallel between anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, and I have thought about anti-Semitism in this regard, is because you can see the way that racism can transmute. Okay, and you see it with anti-Semitism where it became about theology and then it became about blood. I think you're seeing a similar thing with Muslims that it was about theology. Now it's becoming increasingly about any kind of genetic Nobody asks what, what you actually believe if you've got a Muslim there. Okay. And so, as I said, the reason I think it's important to say that, and, and I think that being seen as this um, part of this mass of poor people who might be trying to invade, who might be trying to get in, I think is an element of contemporary Islamophobia, along with terrorism, along with everything else, and along with the fact that it's been convenient, easy scapegoats in that regard. Um, but as I said, the reason I think, and the reason I bother to make the point, is that I don't think it. Um, yeah, I, I 
I don't think that other communities would be immune to that of censorship. Well, you see it in the UK, not with the asylum seekers, but Polish refugees, with not Polish refugees, Polish immigrants from the mm. EU, where there were too many of them, and they didn't have a lot of money. Yeah, 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 all of a sudden everybody was anti-Polish. You know, I think that racism is more slippery and more adaptable and more easily deployed and conveniently used. And, we sh and, I, and, and, and I think we should always be on guard against mm. that. Which is, I mean, if I can pick that up and just, just build on that. I mean, is it as, I mean, building on your question, I think you do see it with Mexicans and in, in the US and so forth. I mean, is it just this, I mean, the other theory I would put is that there was this fear that people have of outsiders, maybe particularly poor outsiders who might come in. Mm. Um, and it's convenient to find mm -hmm. a label, so in Australia, maybe it's Islamophobia, and in America it's a bit more around. Mexicans in the UK, it's a mix of the Islamophobia and the Polish, but at the end of the day, it's, it's a fear of, of and so I'm just curious as to whether you see it as being brought in this country, particularly with Islamophobia, is used against refugees, and, and maybe it's whoever that or who happens to be. Um, if it is a fear of people who are poor, or people in unha unhappy circumstances rather than materially poor, perhaps, I think there is a bit in that. Um, I suspect that a lot of Australians, some Australians at least, think that we will somehow be impoverished if anyone else shares our good fortune. Um, whereas I, th I would have thought we're more impoverished if we allow our national character to be betrayed. Uh, but then that's just a difference. You'd have to ask Scott Morrison. <laughs> <laughs> one here and then we we'll do one there, one there. Um, I'm just wondering what your um, ideas are, are on the, incre the marked increase we've seen in, in Islamophobia in the last year and a half because I think that's been connected particularly to asylum seekers. Um, we've had uh, myself and Linda Briskman started a um, website called Voices Against Bigotry and we were concerned about Islamophobia when we heard that there was going to be an anti-Muslim party contest the election. And we were shocked. We thought, oh my God, this is, that's it, let's do something. Since then, we've had all these Reclaim Australia rallies. We had six anti-Muslim parties at the election. We had Sonia Kruger, Pauline Hanson, people writing in the Australian that you know, Muslims should be interred. And as someone who's raising their children as Muslim in Australia, I mean, and someone who's been brought up in a middle class, white, privileged, you know, I have felt completely shocked and scared for my children's future at the sort of tone and the very, very quick way that this has shifted. So I'm, I'm wondering uh, how you would explain that and what you think we can do about it. Well, the change over the last 18 months, which is the start of your question, I think is probably because starting with the Charlie Hebdo attack in Paris and then the Bataclan attack and so on, um, those things were terribly serious and terribly dramatic and were immediately pinned on Muslims, uh, which tend to increase the sense of fear which people had about Muslims generally. I mean, one of the bizarre things that you get from intellectual giants like Sonia Kruger and Andrew Bolt is the notion that um, if some terrorists are Muslims, therefore all terrorists are Muslims. Sorry. Or Muslims are terrorists, you get the idea. It's, it's very, very loose thinking. But no one is out there contradicting it. And if they're all terrorists, then we want to be protected from them. The fact that it's called Bora Protection, I think, is a dog whistle way of saying these are people you need to be frightened of. Now, whether that is because they're Muslim, I mean, I think it is actually. Uh, even if they're Tamils from Sri Lanka, they're Muslim. You know, that's how silly it is. Um, I, I, I don't think I can answer your question beyond that, but I think it's terrorism internationally that's caused it. I've been having interesting emails just recently from a bloke, uh, an Australian, who started writing to me, at first quite rationally and then increasingly bizarre things. He just proposed that we should repeat in Australia what Billy Hughes did almost a hundred years ago, he said we should set up concentration camps in Australia and put all Muslims <coughs> there. 
Now, I mean, that's a, the fact that someone can actually express that view to someone they've never met, I think is seriously frightening. But the fact the Australian can print a letter to face yeah. the that as well, I think is more yeah. frightening. Yeah, 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 I agree. Two questions that you want. Yes. Um, after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the West needed a new enemy. They had communism before. And uh, I recall Bush Senior making his first, in, very soon after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, making comments about Muslims and Islam. Suddenly, you know, I thought, aha, that's going to be the new enemy. And it's been shown to be true. And I just curious to know what your view is, you know, the, the whole propaganda machine, you know, the Nazis, the, the, you know, the Americans, and, you know, we've always got to have an enemy and project onto all, all society's faults onto that enemy mm. to distract the, the people's uh, view that, you know, oh, the government's doing everything right and it's those people over there that are wrong, you know, it's... Yeah. Yeah, no, and yeah. oh, look, I, I agree with the observation. I, I can't do better than refer back to what Goering said. And to mention to you, for those of you who have not heard of it, there's a wonderful short story by Ursula Le Guin called The Ones Who Walk Away From Omelis. Uh, you can get it on the internet. It's, uh, it's only a few thousand words. Very good little story. It's about a place called Omelis, an imagined place called Omelis, which is have beautiful architecture, beautiful art, beautiful music, beautiful everything. And um, when children uh, enter their adolescence, they're introduced to the fact that all of the beauty and splendour of Amelis depends on one critical thing, and that is a child held in a basement under a building in one of the, you know, in the centre of the city, held in misery uh, um, and, and degradation. And they are taken to see this child when they're introduced to the idea. And the story finishes with the observation that the children typically go home and weep, but then their tears dry when they realise that civilised treatment would, would be something that this child wouldn't recognise and wouldn't get any benefit from. And then they, after all, there's all of these, this beauty that they have and they can thank the child for it. But she says, some of the children do not go home in tears, do not go home at all. They keep walking out of the city of Amelis and across to a place which might not even exist, but they seem to know where they're going. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful story. I recommend you look it up. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you for a great narration. Um, Australia is one of the few countries that doesn't have a convention on human rights in the Commonwealth. And I wonder, just as a cut through, if we recognise people's rights not to be suffering, and uh, maybe that would help us uh, deal with our refugee issue <coughs> in Romania. Okay. Um, uh, it's a good question. Uh, in fact, Australia is the only Western democracy not to have human rights protection in its law. Um, and you may remember that Kevin Rudd set up a, an inquiry headed by Frank Brennan to inquire into whether we should have a statutory bill of rights um, Frank, um, I think rather against his initial impulse, reported that we should, and then Kevin Rudd unilaterally said that we wouldn't. And I think that makes us the only country in the world which has turned its mind to human rights protection in the 21st century and has decided against it. But if you're interested in the idea of a human rights protection in Australia, um, um, the best argument in favour of the Bill of Rights was articulated by John Howard. He was, in a doorstop interview, he was asked what he thought about the idea of a Bill of Rights, and he said, I think they're a very bad idea because they interfere with what the Parliament can do. That's the point. <laughs> 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 Um, well, no, 
I don't know what the rules of your cats are. You oh, oh, you're talking about Tim Wilson or no, 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 no. <laughs> Oh, I'll, 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 I'll boycott kind of Wilson Chagoonie. It's a great idea. <laughs> but mind you, as a lawyer, I'm not allowed to say that. So. <laughs> um, um, how do you get, look, I don't know how to get my voice heard. Because frankly, the only place that I get heard is in meetings like this, in the Fairfax Press, in the Guardian Australia. It's irrelevant. Because 70% of Australians get their news primarily from Murdoch sources, either online or in hard copy. And those are not so interested in hearing my voice. They are not interested in publishing my ideas. <coughs> so, I don't know. If you come up with something, tell me, because I'd like to know how I can get heard. Because <laughs> I really, seriously, I really lament what is happening to this country, to the spirit of this country. It's terrible. We have become accustomed to the idea that we can mistreat people and it is somehow okay. But it isn't. I think we'll just do one more question over here. Yeah. Um, you raised an interesting point about the fact that we saw footage of so the ABC program on the uh, for use up in Northern Territory and even the image of the little boy in Aleppo um, in the back of the hospital was enough to, I guess, provoke a sense of outrage in the community. But then we release uh, over 2,000 files through the Guardian on the route. Is it a lack of an image that you think doesn't stir public conscience or do you trace it to a Section 42D problem or uh, how do you see that? Um, I think if we could get um, images from inside detention, that would make a difference. I mean, the, the photograph of uh, little Alan Curdy's corpse on a beach in the Mediterranean was very powerful, instantaneously. The photograph of the footage of that kid on the orange chair covered in blood, very powerful. Uh, if we could get images from detention, that would help. But it's going to be very difficult because um, last year, as you know, the government, with support from Labor, passed the Australian Border Force Act, which includes Section 42, which identifies a category of people called entrusted persons. And an entrusted person is basically anyone who works in the detention <coughs> system, either in the department or as a subcontractor. <coughs> and if it makes it a criminal offence, punishable by two years jail, for an entrusted person to disclose anything that they learn in their capacity as an entrusted person. So, the doctors on Nauru who are aware of cases of child sex abuse face two years jail if they disclose that fact publicly. If it happened in Melbourne, they'd face jail if they didn't disclose it. They have to report it as a matter of law. Um, so, you know, getting, getting the sort of footage from Nauru or from Manus uh, equivalent to what we saw from Don Dale would be incredibly difficult. Now, Eva Orne's recent film, Chasing Asylum, had some footage taken inside Nauru and Manus. It wasn't particularly dramatic, uh, didn't set the world on fire. But if you could see the real horrors, I think that might change things. Don't know how you do it. We might um, leave, um, leave it there, so um, I'm going to call on.